and do not crave the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Ever since chapter 4, verse 30. There is something very touching in this verse. Crave not the Holy Spirit of God. It does not say, don't make him angry. There are some men of hard character that makes another angry, but it does not give them much pain. For grief is a sweet combination of anger and of love. You perhaps would not care much if you had made anyone angry. When we see anger in another, we at once begin to feel hostility. Anger begets anger, but grief begets pity, and pity is next akin to love, and is love to whom we have cause to grieve. When something disturbed or unfavorable comes between loving relationships with faithful and close friends, it feel grief, or when children disobedient, disrespect, or disgrace to their loving parents, they feel grief. Love is from the heart, and so grief is a painful experience to the heart. It is by the Holy Spirit we are saved, by whom we are saved unto the day of redemption. Saved means it is completely belong to God, and if we forget God and commit sin, he feel grief. The selling, of course, has threefold meaning. Firstly, it is a selling of attestation or confirmation. The Spirit itself bears the witness with our spirit that we are born of God. Faith is that sell by the Spirit, is true, real, genuine faith. It is possible for a man to know for sure that he is secured of heaven. It is a selling of attestation. Secondly, selling of appropriation. When men put their mark upon an article, it is to show that it is their own. The king himself boasts his broad arrow upon everything that is his property. So the Holy Spirit boasts the broad arms of God upon the hearts of all his people. He sells us, Thou shalt be mine, said the Lord. And the day when I make up my jewels. Thirdly, by selling at men preservation, men sell up that which they wish to have preserved, and when a document is sold, it becomes valid henceforth. Now it is by the Spirit of God that we are sold, he is preserved, sold unto the day of redemption. The chosen seed cannot be lost. They must be brought home at last. But how? By the selling of the Spirit. What will be the sad result of craving the Spirit? If we have craved Him, how may we bring Him back again? Instead of running after Christ, we are running after the temptations that are in the world through lust. And then His Spirit is craved. He sorrows in his soul, because he knows what sorrow these things must bring to our souls. We crave to him yet more if we indulge in outward acts of sin. If we commit sin, if we bring disgrace, if we tempt others to go into iniquity by our evil example, it is not long before the Holy Spirit will begin to crave Again, if we neglect prayer, if we forget to read his word, if we live merely for ourselves and not to Christ, then the Holy Spirit will be craved. Again, ingratitude tends to crave him. Nothing got a man to the hurt more than after having done his utmost for another. He turns around and repays him with ingratitude or insult. Again, the Holy Spirit is exceedingly craved by our unbelief when we distrust the promised habit given and applied, when we doubt the power or the affection of our blessed Lord. Now suppose the Holy Spirit is craved, what is the effect produced upon us? When the Spirit is craved, first He appears with us, and when the Spirit of God goes away from the soul, 
and suspensed all his operations. What a miserable state we are in. He suspends his instructions. We read the Bible. We cannot understand it. We go to our commentaries. They cannot tell us the meaning. We fall on our knees and ask to be taught, but we get no answer. We learn nothing. Now he takes from us all spiritual power. Once we go to all things, now we can do nothing. We go preaching, and there is no pleasure in preaching, and no God follows it. There is the intention to the God, or perhaps not even that, but there is no power to accomplish the intention. The Lord has withdrawn Himself, His light, His joy, His comfort, His spiritual power, all are gone. And so, when the Spirit goes away, faith shuts off its flowers. No perfume is held. Oh, how we ill treat Him! How did we disrespect and reject Him? How did we despise the ordinance? which would lead us to Christ. How did we wear led in that holy robe which we gently drawing us to Christ in his cross? How often did he control you from sin when you were about to throw tumbling into a course of vice? How often did he constrain you to God when you have neglected it? You perhaps would not have been in the way at all, and the Lord would not have met you, if it had not been for that sweet spirit, who would not let you become a blasphemer, who would not suffer you to forsake the house of God, and would not permit you to become a regular attendant at the hands of wives, but check you and held you in, as it were, with the bed and bread. Though you struggle against him, Yet he would not throw the reins upon your neck. But he said, I will have him. I will change his heart. I will not let him go till I have made him a trophy of my mighty power to save. Then in that blessed hour, was it not the Holy Spirit who guided you to Jesus? Furthermore, forget not how much we owe to the Spirit's support, how much has he manifested his love to you in cherishing you in all your sickness, assisting you in all your labors, and comforting you in all your distress. He has been a blessed comforter when every other comfort fell, when the promise itself seemed empty, when the ministry was void of power. It is then the Holy Spirit has proved a rich comfort unto my soul and filled my poor heart with peace and joy in believing. Thus we must love the Holy Spirit of God, for we have in all this abundant proofs of His love to us. Remember how much He loves us when He helped our infirmities. Not only He helped our infirmities, but when we know not what to pray for us we ought, he teaches us how to pray, and when we ourselves cry out within ourselves, then the Spirit himself makes intercessions for us, with crowning which cannot be uttered, crowns as we should crown, but more clearly so that our prayer, which else would have been silent, reaches the heirs of Christ, and is then presented before his Father's face. Oh, how much you owe to the Spirit when you have been on your knees in prayer. All this we have done not by our own strength, but by the mighty and by the power of the Spirit, and saying has so sweetly enabled us though we have so often forget to thank him, seeing that has so graciously assisted us, though we have often taken all the glory to ourselves instead of discussions it to him. Must we not admire his love, and must it not be fearful, saying indeed, 
to Christ the Holy Spirit, by whom we are saved, another to come of the Spirit's love remains, namely, his entwining in the hearts of believers. Conclusion There may be some of you here who have lost the visible presence of Christ with you, who have the in fact so craved the Spirit that has gone. It is mercy for you to know that the Spirit of God never leaves His people. He sometimes leaves them that they may get good by knowing their own weakness, but He will not leave them finally to perish. Search out for the sin that has craved the Spirit. Give it up and eliminate that sin upon the spot. Repent with tears inside. Continue in prayer and never rest satisfied until Holy Ghost comes back to you. Above all, be much in prayer to God and let your daily cry be return, O Holy Spirit, return and dwell in my soul. Yell to Him, resist Him not, grieve Him not, but yell to Him, listen to Him, obey Him, He moves you. The Spirit is vexed unto you now in this short sentence. Repent and be converted, every one of you, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. He that believed in the Lord Jesus and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. May the Lord grant that we may not crave the Holy Spirit. Amen. Visit my next video and also please subscribe my channel so that you will get notified all my videos. Thank you for watching my video. May God bless you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14 verse 6. I am. In the Greek language, I am is a very intense way of referring to oneself. It would be comparable to saying, I myself and only I am. In Matthew chapter 22 verse 32, Jesus quotes Exodus chapter 3 verse 6, where God uses the same intensive form to say, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. In John chapter 8 verse 58, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I said unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. The Jews clearly understood Jesus to be calling himself God because they took up stones to stone him for committing blasphemy and equating himself with God. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, as Jesus gave the great commission, he gave it Ephesus by saying, I am with you always to the end of the age. And John chapter 18 verse 4 to 6, when the soldiers came seeking Jesus in the garden the night before his crucifixion, he told them, I am he. And his words were so powerful that the soldiers fell to the ground. These words reflect the very name of God in Hebrew, Yahweh, which means to be where the self-existing one. It is the name of power in authority, and Jesus claimed it as his own. The way Jesus used the definite article to distinguish himself as the only way. A way is a path or road, and the disciples had expressed their confusion about where he was going and how they could follow. As he had told them from the beginning, Jesus again tell them in us, follow me. There is no other path to heaven, no other way to the Father. Peter reiterated the same truth years later to the rulers in Jerusalem, saying about Jesus, Acts chapter 4 verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. The exclusive nature of the only path to salvation is, is expressed in the words, I am the way. Again in John chapter 10, Jesus compared himself to a court shepherd. 
when he has proud out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him, because they know his voice. But they will not follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him, because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the cat for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the cat. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pastures. Sheep do not choose their own bed to safety and protection, but rely on the shepherd to guard and care for them. In order to be saved, we have to trust the shepherd and not wander off on our own adventures and try to find out our own way. But we, when we follow Jesus, he leads us to exactly where we need to be. Finally, he is making clear that he is the way to the Father and by extension to heaven. He says that he goes to prepare a place for us and this suggests that after we have completed the journey of this life, we will find ourselves in a place of race where the Father is. The truth. Again, Jesus used the definite article to emphasize himself as the only truth. Psalms chapter 119 verse 142 says, Your, your law is the truth. In fact, Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Jesus as the incarnate word of God, John chapter 1 verse 1, is the source of all truth. After Jesus has been arrested, he found himself standing before Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. Pilate found no evidence of any crime worthy of death, but was fascinated by his talk of a kingdom that was not of this world. John chapter 18 verse 36. Jesus replies, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens my voice. Pilate's response comes in the form of a question the same question that humanity has been asking for centuries, and the same response to Jesus that keeps so many from the faith. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Jesus answered discussions in John chapter 14 with the devils when he tells them, I am the truth. Jesus can testify to the truth and teach the truth, because he himself is the truth. The words of John chapter 1 verse 1 set the stage for this very fact. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In this one sentence, John is proclaiming Jesus as the Word, which would have suggested that he is the beginning and the end of all that has been true throughout eternity, and that to seek the truth ultimately leads us to seek Him, the life. This saying also draws us back to the shepherd analogy of John chapter 10. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. I am the God shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Here Jesus is not only painting a picture of how he depends and leads his sheep, but also foreshadowing his death on the cross. Jesus is teaching us and that we are to really be concerned with, is not this life, but with eternal life. The scriptures speak of, an, of the life to come after our life. And as we follow the voice of our shepherd, we can craft what that eternal life is in the here and now. 
we can live this life in such a way that we are not judging things that do not last, but judging things that do last and have eternal significance. When Jesus refers to himself as the way, the truth, and the life, he is giving us a better way to live our lives through him. He is showing us that through following him daily in faith, he will lead us to be to be a better, richer, and more meaningful than we could ever find on our own. Conclusion Jesus was declaring himself the great I am, the only path to heaven, the only true measure of righteousness, and the source of both physical and spiritual life. He was taking his claim as the very God of creation, the Lord who placed Abraham, and the Holy One who inhabits eternity. He did this so the disciples would be able to face the dark days ahead and carry on the mission of declaring the gospel to the world. Of course, we know from the scripture that they still did not understand, and it took several visits from the risen Lord to shake them out their disbelief. Once they understood the truth of his words, they became changed people. In the world was never pain the same. So, how do we follow him today? The same way the disciples did long ago. They heard the words of Jesus and believed them. They took his words and obeyed them. They confessed their sins to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They believed that he died to take the punishment of their sins and rose from the dead to give them new life. To follow his example and command to tell others the truth about sin, righteousness, and judgment. When we follow him in the way, we can be assured of the following, following him all the way to heaven. Thank you for watching my video. Visit my next video and please subscribe my channel so that you will get notified all my videos. Thank you. May God bless you. In the year 1970s and 80s, there was a great revival in the churches in Akalen. Many people felt prostrate under the power of the Holy Spirit. There was an endless stream of people confessing their sins. There was continual prayer being placed. The revival continued to spread from tribe to tribe throughout Nakalan. Almost all the tribes of Nakast in the northeast India all were terribly impacted by the light and power of the gospel. The miracles and signs and wonders that accompanied the revival are so numerous. Some of the story are so remarkable that you may struggle to believe they happened, but they were witnessed by many people. After pouring out their souls and receiving God's forgiveness, their sorrow was overtaken by overflowing peace, joy, and happiness. A correct Bible references were spoken that often spoke directly to the condition of a person's heart in a way that only God could know. According to Bible, our first encounter with the Holy Spirit is when He convicts us of sin, shows us that none of us can live up to the righteousness of Jesus, and reveals to us the judgment that is coming to those who die without a Savior. John chapter 16 verse 8 to 11. As we repent, confess our sins, and receive the gift of salvation, the Holy Spirit regenerates our dead inner human spirit, which now becomes sensitive to the spiritual things of God. John chapter 3 verse 1 to 16, Acts chapter 2 verse 38. There is a second work of the Holy Spirit when he baptizes a believer. Acts chapter 2 verse 1 to 4. It is available to all, Acts chapter 2 verse 39, and a cave of empowerment, helping the believer to live a holy life. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Helper, we become more like Jesus and are directed to do the Father's will. Furthermore, the cave is primarily for the empowerment to witness to others, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. 13 divine characteristic of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit 
is the third person of the Trinity. This means the Holy Spirit is God, co-equal with God the Father and God the Son, and is of the same essence. They are co-equally God, meaning they are all the being of God. In other words, they do not exist independently one from the other. So you cannot remove one of the three persons of God and still have God as revealed in the Bible. Here are a number of references that point to the Holy Spirit reign characteristic. He is called God. Acts chapter 5 verse 3 and 4. He is called the Spirit of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Judges chapter 3 verse 10. He is considered God. Acts chapter 28 verse 25 to 27. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 16. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 7 to 9. He is treated as equal to God the Father and the Son. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. First Corinthians chapter 12 verse 4 to 6. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18. First Peter chapter 1 verse 2, etc. He is eternal. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14. He is self existent. Romans chapter 8 verse 2. He is omnipresent. Psalms chapter 139 verse 7 and 8. He is omniscient. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 and 11. John chapter 14 verse 26 and John chapter 16 verse 13. He is sovereign. Zechariah chapter 12 verse 10. He was involved with creation. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. He enabled the writing of the Bible. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 21. He helps us to recognize the glory of God. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. He enables us to call upon Jesus as Lord. First Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. The following are the ten ways the Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers. Number one. The Holy Spirit is a helper who teaches and reminds. John chapter 14 verse 26, Jesus told his disciples, The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things in praying to your remembrance that I have said to you. The Greek word parakletos in this passage is translated helper, advocate, counselor, the meaning of this relates to legal counsel. The Holy Spirit provides wise counsel to Christ's followers. Jesus knew he would be going away and that his followers would need the Holy Spirit as a helper and an adv advocate to remind them of his teachings. Secondly, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. In addition to providing wise counsel, a true also provide evidence used to convict criminals. Any similar, the Holy Spirit will prove the sin, righteousness, and judgment of the world. John chapter 16 verse 7 and 8 Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Number three, the Holy Spirit dwells in believers and fills them. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in the lives of believers. First Corinthians chapter three verse sixteen. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Number four. The Holy Spirit is a source of revelation, wisdom, and power. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thought, except for the own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. God gives His followers the Holy Spirit so that we may know Him better. Since the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit, it knows the thoughts 
of God and reveals those thoughts to believers. Jesus knew that his disciples would need the power to carry out their mission to be witnesses to, to the entire world. Jesus told his disciples, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Ever since chapter 1 verse 17 to 20, I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believed. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Number 5. The Holy Spirit guides to all truth, including knowledge of what is to come. The Holy Spirit tells what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. And John, John chapter 16 verse 13, because he guides believers in all truth, Jesus told his disciples the Holy Spirit would make known what he hears and would only speak what the Father speaks. John chapter 16 verse 13 to 15, but when he, the Spirit of Truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Number six. The Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to believers. Attributes of the Holy Spirit such as wisdom, knowledge, and power are manifested in the lives of believers for the good of others. More gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, to verse 7 to 11. Number 7. The Holy Spirit is a cell in the lives of believers. The Holy Spirit is our mark of adoption as God's children. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to his followers so that they could be confident in their salvation. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the cell, the promised Holy Spirit, who is it deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's portion to the price of His glory. Number 8. The Holy Spirit helps any believer's weakness and intercedes for them. We all have times we feel weak and do not know what to do. The Holy Spirit helps us line up with God's will during those times by interceding for us. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 and 27 in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our witness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through worthless crowns, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Number nine, the Holy Spirit makes believers new and gives them eternal life. The Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers to renew, sanctify, and make them holy. Just the Holy Spirit raised Christ from the dead. The Holy Spirit will give eternal life to believers in Christ. Romans chapter 8 verse 10 and 11. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. 
and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from death is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Number 10. The Holy Spirit sanctifies and enables us to bear good fruit in our lives. The work of the Holy Spirit is an ongoing process of becoming holy through sanctification. Through the conviction and power of the Holy Spirit, believers will not indulge the sinful acts of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 to 21 but will bear the good fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 to 25 Furthermore, we also need to know the following Bible verses. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 to 16 For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you received do not make you slaves, so that your life is fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Titus chapter 3, verse 46. He saves us through the washing of repair in renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Thank you for watching my video. Please subscribe to my channel so that you will get notified all my videos. Thank you. May God bless you. I will tell you that God loves everyone. Jesus shed his blood for atonement of sin for every one of us. So welcome all of you to my channel so that a lot of things we need to discuss and share about God's love and His marvelous work for the salvation of all of us. Today I want to share a topic about a personal relationship with Jesus, why this relationship is so important, how to have relationship with Jesus. I will give the answer according to the scripture. So dear friends, please listen and study prayerfully so that God will help you to understand his word. Also, it is my prayer and I believe that many of you will understand his word better if you study it prayerfully with all your heart. A relationship with Jesus is the most important relationship of a person can have. First of all, let us discuss a question like what will happen if you have a personal relationship with Jesus? Or what will be the result if you have a personal relationship with Christ? To answer the questions, firstly, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, it will result in new life. Okay, so what is new life? To know about new life, we must know the following facts from the Bible. Number 1. Romans chapter 3 verse 10 and 12. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. All have turned away, and they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And bad news here is that we all sinful and call before God, who is perfect and just. God loves you and created you to have personal relationship with Him. But sin has separated us from God, and the relationship between God and us is broken. So what shall we do? What will be the solution for that? The answer is, Jesus is God's only solution for our sins. Through Him, you can have a personal relationship with God. We must each respond to Jesus Christ by placing our trust as our Savior and Lord. Let me read a Bible verse, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. But because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by Christ you have been saved. Secondly, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus, it will resolve forgiveness. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 For has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins 
we must note that when the sinner trusts and believes in Jesus, that sinner becomes a son of God, has literally a new creature, has born again, has been justified by the blood of Christ. Thirdly, if you have personal relationship with Jesus, it will it will resolve the entwining of the Holy Spirit within you. John chapter 14 verse 16 and 17 And I will ask the Father and He will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him for He lives with you and will be in you. The entrilling of the Holy Spirit is the action by which God takes up permanent residence in the body of a believer in Jesus Christ. Jesus revealed to his disciples the new role the Spirit of Truth would play in your lives. He lives with you and will be in you. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you are proud with the price that glorify God in your body. The word temple, which we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, is used to describe the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum and all this demon tabernacle structure. In that tabernacle, God's presence would appear in a cloud and meet the high priest who came once a year into the Holy of Holies, according to the Bible. On the day of atonement, the high priest brought the blood of his land animal and sprinkled it on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. On this special day, God granted forgiveness to the priest in his people. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7, The believer in Christ has become the inner sanctum of God, the Holy Spirit. As the believer has been sanctified and forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ, the believer in Christ became the habitation of the Holy Spirit of God. In fact, Scripture also says that Colossians chapter 1 verse 27, the believer is entailed spiritually by Christ. Fourthly, by having personal relationship with Jesus results bodily resurrection and a home in heaven. John chapter 14 verse 19, Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live you also will live. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20-21 But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from the, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that one day we will go to heaven, because our sins are forgiven by having received Jesus Christ as Savior. John chapter 3 verse 16 For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Since a believer could go to be with Christ immediately after death, what is the purpose of this resurrection? While the soul and spirit could be with Christ immediately after death, the physical body remains in the grave. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 to 18 at the resurrection the physical body is resurrected clarified and reunited with your soul and spirit this reunited clarified body soul and spirit will be the positions of believers for eternity in the new universe in earth revelation chapter 21 and 22 so now the question is how to have personal relationship with christ we must know that to establish a relationship with Jesus is not difficult. While talking about a personal relationship with Christ, we must know the following facts. Number one, Jesus himself came to seek and to save what was lost. Luke chapter 19 verse 10, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Jesus died for sinners like you and me. And he seeks us and to save us and to have personal relationship in your life.
Secondly, has issued an invitation, according to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Thirdly, has called for our trust. John chapter 14, verse 1, Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Jesus saves you and helps you both physically and spiritually. He provides your needs abundantly. The only thing we need to do is to trust Him. Only trusting Him can make a personal relationship with Him. Fourthly, He has spoken to us as friends. John chapter 15, verse 14 and 15. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. So, to understand better and to summarize the topic above regarding personal relationship with Jesus, we need to look at a few relatively simple truths found in the Bible. The first truth is we need to recognize naturally our relationship with God is broken. We have sinned against Him. We are all sinners. We have done things that are wrong in His sight. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The second truth is to have a relationship with Jesus. We also need to understand the biblical truth that is mentioned in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death. Wages are the payment for what we have done. So the payment will result of our sin is dead. This is speaking of a spiritual death, eternal separation from God. Thirdly, to have a relationship with Jesus, we also need to grab at the truth, this wonderful one. God loves you and me in spite of our sins. He has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us as our substitute. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. He sacrificed himself for us while we were still strangled from him. He chose to take the punishment that we deserve, dog our bless. Then we need to admit that there is absolutely nothing we can do to save ourselves. We to contribute for our salvation. On the basis of Christ's sacrifice, God forgives our sins by Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. It is by Christ you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. The Lord Jesus has already done all the works. John chapter 19 verse 30 and he did it perfectly salvation is not about what we can do but what Christ has done knowing this truth from the scripture you can have a personal relationship with Jesus by receiving him by faith thrown from your sin and trust Jesus call out to him as risen Savior who conquered death once and for all Accept Him as your Lord and Master. The Bible promises in John chapter 1 verse 12, As many as receive Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. So dear friends, you can receive Jesus by faith and thus you can begin a relationship with Him. This very moment, right where, where you are, as you watch this with you, you can express your faith in Him by praying a similar like this with all your heart. God, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I deserve the consequences of my sin, but I am trusting in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I believe that His death and resurrection provided for my forgiveness. I trust in Jesus and Jesus alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me 
and for giving me a man. Thank you for watching my video. Please subscribe my channel so that you will get notified all my video. Thank you. Religions with Messianic concept include Christians, Muslims, Hinduism, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, Judaism, Taoism, Babism, etc. So now we ask questions like Who is the Messiah? Is Jesus the Messiah? Why Messiah is important? Is Messiah God himself? Who is Messiah in the Bible? What are the prophecies about the Messiah? The Bible verse declared that Jesus is the Messiah. Matthew chapter 1 verse verse 16 and Jacob the father of Joseph the husband of Mary of whom Jesus was born who is called Christ in fact every time someone says Jesus Christ is re referring to Jesus as the Messiah why because Christ means Messiah or anointed one when we read John chapter 1 verse 29 to 41 find an interesting story Verses 29 and 30, the next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Love the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. The one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. He who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Verses 35 and 36, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Love the Lamb of God. Verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Verse 41, The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him we have found the Messiah, which translate means Christ. In another story, in Luke chapter 2 verse 25 to 30 Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and this man was righteous and devout looking for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ and he came in the spirit into the temple when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all people. John chapter 4 verse 25 and 26. The omen, Samaritan omen said to Jesus, I know that the Messiah God Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I the one speaking to you, I am he. So all the above from the scripture declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Now let us look into the Old Testament so that we can study prophecies about the Messiah. Let me mention some of the important ones. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Matthew chapter 3 verse 1 to 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor, the Bible commentator Matthew Henry wrote, For he was intimately acquainted with the counsels of God from eternity, and he gave counsel to the children of men in which counsel our welfare. It is by him that God has given us counsel. Psalms chapter 16 verse 7 
Revelation chapter 3 verse 10 And such is the work of the Mediator that no less a power than that of the mighty God could accomplish it. Everlasting Father Matthew Henry also wrote He is the Everlasting Father, Word Father of Eternity. He is God, one with the Father, who is from everlasting to everlasting. He was from eternity, Father of the great work of redemption. His heart was upon it. It was the product of his wisdom as the counselor of his love as the everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Again, he is the Prince of Peace. As again, he preserves the peace, commands peace, he creates peace in his kingdom. He is our peace. And it is his peace that both keeps the heart of his people and rules in them. He is not only a peaceable prince and his reign peaceable, but he is the order and giver of all God. And that peace which is the present and future place of his subject. Jesus is the Son of God and it is not in the sense of a human father and son. God did not get married and have a son. Jesus is God's son in the sense that his God made manifest in human form. John chapter 1 verse 14 The word can flesh and made his dwelling among us. He was conceived and married by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1 verse 35 declares The angel answered the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Let us look further to the scripture about the prophecies, prophecies of the Messiah. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 Therefore the Lord himself will give you his sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear his son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 53 He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God. He pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and by his wound we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord had, has laid on him the iniquity of us all. John chapter 1 verse 1 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Also Christ is ended God's perfect revelation of himself in the flesh. Jesus' own word to flip, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me? Flip, he who has sent me has sent the Father. How do you say, show us the Father? John chapter 14 verse 9. Let us look into the scripture why Messiah is so important for us. Number one, Messiah would bring a new covenant. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 to 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. I will put my law within them, and on your heart I will write it, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Matthew chapter 26, Verse 28, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Also Hebrew chapter 9, verse 15, For this reason, Christ is the mediator of new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died 
as a ransom to settle free from their sins. Number two, Messiah ought to retentive text. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of the sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Number three, Messiah would appear or sense in suffering in our place. Matthew chapter 8 verse 16 and 17. When evening came, many who were demon bosses were proud to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and held all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 and Mark chapter 10 verse 45. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Number four, Messiah would be a willing sacrifice. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. In the base of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts in your mind, minds in Christ Jesus. Number five, the Messiah would be the great light. Isaiah chapter nine, verse two, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has turned. The same reference we, we find in New Testament, Matthew chapter four, verse 16. Again, John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. Number six, Messiah would perform signs of healing. Isaiah chapter 35, verse five and six. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lamb leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Matthew chapter 11, verse 4 to 6, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lamb walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news spread to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. From the above, we found that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. We need Him for forgiveness and assurance of our salvation. On this earth, we have friends. Jesus will not leave you even if all your friends leave you. Now is the time to love Him and accept Him as your personal Savior. May God bless you. Is salvation by faith alone or by faith plus works? This perhaps the most important questions in all of Christian theology. Am I saved just by believing in Jesus? Or do I have to believe in Jesus and do certain things? The above argument is raised due to James chapter 2 verse 24. It says, A person is justified by what he does, and not by faith alone. At the same time, according to Paul, we have been justified by faith. Romans chapter 3 verse 28 For 
we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 for it is by Christ you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. In support of the above, let us compare with the following verses. John chapter 3 verse 16 declares, Salvation is given to whoever believes in him. That means, whoever believes Jesus will have eternal life. In another verse, Acts chapter 16 verse 31 proclaims, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Yet another verse, Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, has a new creation, the all has gone, the new has come. So now back to James chapter 2, let me read some verses, verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have fed but has no deeds? Can such fed save them? In verse 15 and 16, James gives an example. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or daily food. If any one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about the physical needs, what good is it? Verse 17, in the same way, fed by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. We may use some examples like, suppose we go to church regularly, attend prayer meeting, etc., but outside the church, if we live selfish, dishonest, corruption, no love for others, etc., then it is not a true believer of Christ in his or her heart. Let me continue verse 21. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Verse 22, you see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. Here, Abraham loved and obeyed God. God regarded Abraham as his friends means Abraham have a good personal relationship with God. When God asked Abraham to offer his dear son Isaac and the elder for burnt offering, Abraham obeys God's command, and this is why James brought example of Abraham. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled that say, Abraham believed God, and it, it was created to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Verse 24, you see that a person is considered righteous by what he do and not by faith alone. Verse 26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without taste is dead. Apostle Paul also mentioned in the similar language in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1 to 3 verse 1 If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have loved, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging, clanging cymbal. Verse 2 If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mastery and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. 
verse 3 if I gave all I possessed to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love I can nothing here love means a true faith in Jesus Christ can have and which is integral parts of a Christian life again like James Moll also mentioned the examples of their forefather Abraham Abraham justified by faith Romans chapter 4 verse 1 what then shall we say that Abraham our forefather according to the flesh discovered in this matter verse 2 if in fact Abraham was justified by works had something to boast about but not before God verse 3 what does scripture say Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness verse 4 now to the one who works wages are not credited as a gift but as an obligation and the above mentioned examples James and Paul do not disagree in their teaching regarding salvation they approach the same subject yet from different perspectives Paul similar emphasis that justification is by faith alone while James put emphasis on the fact that genuine faith in Christ produces good works works are a product of faith that is chapter 2 verse 14 those who have true faith in Jesus Christ will be eager to do what is good John the Baptist called for fruit in keeping with repentance Matthew chapter 3 verse 8 the book of James emphasized the nature of true saving faith as that which results in good works faith by itself if it is not accompanied by action is dead and as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without deeds is dead James chapter 2 verse 17 and verse 26 Christ through faith saves and that faith is manifest in works if someone claims to have faith yet exhibits no good works his were her faith is dead both faith and works are integral parts of the Christian life biblically faith is the cause of salvation while works are the evidence of it at last we know that our works do nothing to earn our salvation Romans chapter 3 verse 24 it was the once for all sacrifice of Christ that justifies sinners Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 know that a person is not justified by the works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified Galatians chapter 3 verse 2 and 3 we begin by faith and we continue in faith did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard are you so foolish after beginning by means of the spirit are you now trying to attain your call by human effort so to summarize the topic of our we must know that the idea that faith plus works to earn salvation is nowhere doubt in the Bible however it is biblically true that saving faith produces good works that is chapter 2 11 to 14 a balanced reading of the Bible confirms that the two do not contradict James amplifies Paul's teaching in the sense that while Paul addresses the redemption perspective James focuses on the post-redemption life of the believer thank you for watching my videos with you and also please subscribe my channel so that you will get notified all my videos thank you may God bless you